Thanks for joining us at Right on Replicas, where we're proud to bring you the best scale model kit reviews on the planet. This review covers the vintage 1997 release of the Convair RB36H Peacemaker. It's in 172 scale, and it's Revell kit number 85-5710. This kit has been released several times since it was first issued in 1980, and Revell rated this a skill level 2 kit at the time for the intermediate builder due to some intricacies and glue and paint that's required uh, but I would say it's probably closer to uh, the new skill level 4 uh, and this kit goes even further uh, we added some aftermarket decals and some finishing techniques that um, really require some advanced uh, skill sets but this re-release of the kit it has a different box art than the original and inside there are 155 pieces molded in silver with transparent clear parts and uh, fold out instructions and also some water slide decals are supplied included is a display stand for and a four figure crew the kit features a highly detailed interior and movable machine guns it can be in assembled with the bomb bays uh, doors opened or closed and get this its overall length is 27 and 3 quarters uh, I think it's probably one of the largest aircraft models uh, ever released so this is a special review so hope you enjoy it here are the decals with this kit and as you can see the color is good and the registry is good too there's a little bit of yellowing on these decals and you can remove that by simply placing them face out into a window uh, so the sun will bleach out that uh, yellowing but as always um, you want to use some setting solution for decals of this nature and for really old decals sometimes it's uh, best to put a clear spray uh, of lacquer over the entire sheet and then cut them out individually but um, the decal setting solution is important especially on airplanes so that the decals uh, will surround uh, you know rivets and panel lines and uh, look naturally painted we're also going to use some aftermarket decals for this kit from Warbird decals and these are um, accessory decals that really help complete the authenticity of the kit it's decal set number 72003 these are B36 details and there's a lot of work here extra work uh, for example there are 84 no step decals in one size and 21 in another so uh, be prepared for a lengthy decaling session but in the end it'll be worth it for a really good looking finish this uh, model is going to take up some room on your bench my bench was 5 by 3 uh, but I could have used more space the original copy right here shows how old kit is uh, for design and as always uh, be sure to follow the manufacturer's recommendations regarding safety for the use of any of the products you see here in the review. Like I said, this kit is huge. Here we have uh, a reference model, which is a 172 scale uh, kit uh, that uh, <laughs> that uh, looks kind of puny. It's less than half the size of the uh, B36 kit. I'm going to give you my version of the open box review um, and it won't take quite as long as the other guys because they like to pick up every part and tree and kind of try to find some words to describe the pieces but I'm just going to let you look them over here it takes about uh, 15 seconds for this very large kit but as you can see there's uh, some flash on the sprue trees but very little flash on the parts themselves so this kit is uh, remarkably well preserved or maintained I should say uh, since its inception uh, quite some time ago and we're going to um, make sure that uh, you get all that you need to see from our open box review uh, in just a short time here are the clear parts for the kit and as you can see they're um, not as clear uh, and thin as modern day kits but if you use some future floor polish to uh, dip these into um, it really helps them look much more like uh, modern day kits uh, window glass so uh, I would recommend that uh, just to give these uh, a thinner crisper look 
We'll start uh, construction with the cockpit area, which is uh, the norm. Uh, but before that, we're going to do some test fitting. And I happen to notice that was a, a little warp here um, that uh, up towards the cockpit area of the uh, of the uh, starboard side and the fuselage. Now, uh, just pushing that into position, I saw that uh, it would uh, it would go together well. So uh, when we glue that together, uh, that should take care of that. While I was test fitting some of the major parts, uh, I got slightly distracted and started working on the props. Um, there's six props with three blades each, and uh, they need to be cleaned up. Uh, and uh, it was going to take some time, but just use a number 11 blade uh, from your hobby knife to, uh, you know, take off any flash, etc., and clean up any mold seam on each one. Uh, and then paint each prop tip white using uh, some flat white. In this case, I used the Tamiya XF2. Now you can see here in the picture, um, it's a nifty little trick when the prop and spinner are molded as one piece uh, to use a little blue tack uh, putty inside of the spinner case there and a toothpick and a small clamp, clamp there to hold the prop uh, so that it's easier to paint. With the uh, white as a backdrop uh, base coat for those tips, I painted them yellow. <clears throat> and after the yellow had dried, uh, they got masked off with some uh, painter's tape. And the prop tips uh, have a fine mold line that define where the area to be painted yellow is. And once that's masked, the props were painted a uh, gloss black. Uh, after the gloss black is dried, then I masked off the spinners and they were painted using some metalizer chrome, um, some of the Model Master product. So after cleaning up the uh, fuselage halves, uh, by using a hobby knife on the edges and all the openings, for, uh, you can you know, remove any flash uh, and use a couple of sand sticks to make sure everything's smooth and mates together well. Uh, we're going to paint the interior area uh, zinc chromate green and these areas include the cockpit, the fuselage bulkheads, bomb bay walls, bomb racks, and the fuselage walls around each gun uh, aiming blister, and the upper wing area of the landing gear bay. Now while I had the interior green in the airbrush, I also painted the bomb racks for the bomb bay uh, after cleaning up any of the mold uh, ejector pin marks. And in reality, uh, after the bombs are placed on these racks, the ejection pin marks are pretty much hidden anyway, but uh, it's nice to clean things up when you're putting things together. There are actually two decks that uh, form the cockpit for the B-36. These are both painted semi-gloss black and the seat cushions on the lower deck were picked out using some olive drab. And I wasn't worried about painting the seat harnesses as they would, they would not be seen once the cockpit was closed up and the canopies were in place. Um, the seats for the upper deck come as separate pieces and these were also sprayed semi-gloss black and the cushions again uh, painted olive drab. Again, I did not paint the harnesses there because they won't be seen after the crew members are seated. Well, the, the crew figures, by the way, are uh, pretty nicely detailed for the age of this kit. And uh, the four crew members were painted flat white so that I could uh, pick out and see the detail on them. And once uh, I did that, there was some flash on each figure, which uh, you can remove with a hobby knife. Now the flight suits were painted olive drab, the uh, parachute harnesses were uh, U.S. dark green, and the hands and faces were uh, painted a flesh color, a basic skin tone, and to add some color the caps were painted uh, flat red. The headphones and bands were painted in flat black, and in some instances the inside of the flight suit collar was left white to represent the sheepskin fleece, uh, but I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to detailing the figures knowing they would be pretty well hidden under the framework and the canopy. All in all though, uh, I thought they looked pretty nice sitting in there ready to take off. The flight officer's control panel at the rear of the cockpit uh, was painted gloss black before the instrument decal was added and then once that was dry the levers, the throttle levers, uh, were picked out using some gloss red uh, for a little more color and the pilot's uh, instrument panel was painted and decaled in the same way. Then uh, the console between the pilot's seats and the side consoles were decaled using some of the 172 instrument decals from my spare parts box. So remember, never throw away, 
decals or parts from your other models. Lastly, a little color, some yellow, was added to the levers on the center console. When I was uh, painting the fuselage interior, as I mentioned, I also painted the interior bulkheads and the framework that holds the flash bombs in the bomb bay. Since uh, this is the RB-36, it's a reconnaissance version of the B-36, and it carried flash bombs rather than uh, nuclear weapons. The flash bombs were essentially 80-pound flash bulbs that were dropped during photo reconnaissance missions. Flash bombs were sprayed using a medium gray, and the framework behind the bombs was brush painted interior green. Once the paint on these parts was dry, the bomb bay bulkheads were glued to the starboard fuselage half and interior framework, it was glued to both fuselage halves. Then the half round tube on the port side framework, which represents a pressurized tube that allows the crewman to move from the forward pressurized compartment compartments to the rear ones through the unpressurized bomb bay. Uh, a design idea first used on the B-29, and although they would never be seen inside the completed fuselage, a few details were picked out on the cockpit side of the forward bomb bay bulkhead using some black and little red and yellow for color. Finally, glue all the cockpit components into place, and the forward gun turret was then painted gloss black and glued into place too. The bomb racks were glued to the bomb bay framework, and the rear turret was installed before the fuselage was taped closed. Now, for the reason uh, for just taping the fuselage closed for now is that I knew that this model was big and would be a tail sitter unless significant amounts of weight were added to the nose of the aircraft. So in order to do this, all the components are dry fitted, taped together so to speak, and assembled as best as possible. And then weight is added to the nose area until the forward landing gear is sitting on the ground. In the case of this model, it took about one and a half ounces to get the model to sit. Now I did um, this by cutting some pieces of solder and then gluing them into the uh, fuselage behind the cockpit area and once I had enough weight in there I disassembled the model and divided the number of solder pieces in half and then glued the appropriate number of pieces on each side as far forward as possible and in this case right behind the cockpit rear bulkhead and on either side of the radar reconnaissance bulge in the bottom of the fuselage. Once I was happy with the amount of weight in the nose, I glued the gun sights into each of the round gun sight openings, and lastly I inserted the large wing spar between the fuselage halves. I didn't glue the wing spar in place at this time, because I wanted to make sure I could adjust its location once the wings were in place to ensure proper alignment of the wings to the fuselage. Finally, the fuselage halves could be glued together, and remember that gap around the cockpit? Well, this was fixed using a little finger pressure to squeeze the fuselage halves together and then gluing sh short sections of the gap with some super glue, a drop of glue accelerator working slowly along the gap one section at a time. Personally, I don't like using tape or rubber bands to close a gap because in the past I've had the glue run up under the tape or rubber bands and get onto the fuselage. With some careful gluing and the use of super glue accelerator, this is all that's left of that gap behind the fuselage opening. There were a few other small steps between one fuselage half and the other, uh, but these are easily corrected with a little filler putty and some sanding. While waiting on the super glue and the putty to dry on the fuselage, I glued the wing halves together, and I deviated slightly from the instructions here and that I knew that this was going to be a very large model and I wanted to store the model in sections, the fuselage and both wings separately. So in order to do that, I also wanted the props to be removable from the wings. So in step nine, the instructions have you inserting but not gluing the prop shafts into the propeller hub and then inserting both of these into the propeller retainer. So before gluing the two pins of the propeller retainer, into the lower wing halves. Now without doing all of this, I just glued the retainers into the lower wings before adding the top wing half. This way I could paint the prop hub at the same time that I painted the propeller spinner. There's some uh, gaps on the leading and trailing edges of the wing here and there, so I used a little filler to uh, uh, putty these up and then sand it smooth. 
And at this time, the horizontal stabilizer halves were glued together as well. Uh, again, you carefully gluing with uh, uh, you know some super glue, and um, then you may also need to use a little filler and sanding to smooth that off. Once the fuselage was closed up and the wings and stabilizer halves were finished, I added the crew to the cockpit and attached the canopy to the fuselage after masking the canopy framework using some Tamiya tape uh, and a razor blade to uh, emulate the frame lines. So now that the main components were together, it's time for a word about the color scheme chosen for this model. When I was given it to review, I decided to use Alclad 2 metallic paints uh, for the first time and the three main colors I chose were some polished aluminum, a dull aluminum, ALC 117, and um, some magnesium, ALC 111. I used some Model Masters Gloss Black Spray to uh, spray the wings and uh, that is FS17038 in a small rattle can. Uh, it was a little heavy but uh, it actually came out pretty well uh, by using light coats and once uh, those were painted and allowed to dry uh, for 48 hours I uh, went on to the polished aluminum Alclad that's ALC 105 and it requires multiple very thin coats of paint. Fortunately uh, it dries really quickly so you can finish a light coat on one wing do the other and then uh, the fuselage and back again without getting any thick buildup of paint. It's important to keep the airbrush moving as the paint is very thin requiring no thinner and it'll puddle up if uh, you get too much on there at one time. I had masked the canopy in the forward gun position but didn't bother masking the gun sights inside uh, the siding blisters as these could easily be repainted black after the fuselage was painted finished and sealed uh, and before the clear blisters are added. So once the uh, Alclad polished aluminum had cured um, it's really tough uh, and that can be masked easily for little fear of paint lifting when the tapes removed. It's so important that the plastic be clean before it's primed and uh, the primer is cured before applying the aluminum or Alclad paints. If, if this is done they hold up very well to uh, masking. So be prepared for a lot of masking with this three-tone paint scheme. I used both the Revell uh, paint uh, callouts as well as the Warbird decal set callouts and began to outline uh, the area that would be painted dull aluminum using thin strips of Tamiya tape. Now this is where those raised panel lines come in handy. Just follow the panel lines on the instructions and match them up with the raised lines on the model. This was done on both wings, top and bottom, as well as the horizontal stabilizers, top and bottom. The areas not to be sprayed aluminum were then masked using the thin plastic from grocery store bags. And once all was masked, it was time to spray the Alclad 2 dull aluminum. After spraying the dull aluminum uh, and it had time to dry, I removed the masking and checked for any flaws like overspray, etc and despite your best efforts there will always be something somewhere. In this case uh, some paint wound up getting under the masking and this is easily fixed uh, by masking the dull aluminum area and touching it up with some more polished aluminum. With the dull aluminum good and dry so uh, that it will hold up to some handling um, it's, uh, it's time to start one of the more difficult uh, masking uh, jobs and that's for the engine nacelles. Uh, to choose uh, Alclad 2 magnesium uh, I, I had to do it uh, again and I think I would have used a lighter color maybe uh, the shade of Alclad 2 aluminum but um, that's what I used here so regardless of this it, it still looks pretty nice and as always uh, I began using the paint guides and the raised panel lines as guidelines for applying thin strips of Tamiya tape before filling in larger areas with some plastic and painters tape. So the masking is, is somewhat complex but uh, it's not really difficult just time consuming. Um, not difficult but the results are worth it. Uh, this came out very nicely. 
There's a couple of minor issues that I had to clean up followed by a gloss clear coat in preparation for the decals and the wings and horizontal stabilizer uh, and they're all finished at this point and ready to go. Now we can paint our three color fuselage starting with the dull aluminum areas of the forward fuselage, the aft of the wings and the tail area. And again this was done uh, starting with some thin strips of tape to outline the areas to be masked. And then uh, that's followed by using the uh, plastic from grocery bags and the painter's tape to uh, tape or fill, uh, should say close off the areas that you don't want painted. Uh, it's a time consuming process and you have to be careful that none of that uh, goes over any of the panel line masking that you've already applied so that uh, you don't get paint in in or under uh, any area you don't want it to be. So after the paint had time to dry uh, it, the masking was removed uh, and then it was time to mask for the dull, <coughs> dull aluminum area that crossed the fuselage at the wing root and matched the dull aluminum regions on both wings. So to do this I slipped the wings into the wing spar and applied thin strips of tape across the fuselage uh, making sure to match up the dull aluminum regions of the wings again using those raised panel lines. But the panel lines were missing in the center area and as a result of having to clean it up to join the two fuselage halves. So in order to recover those uh, dimensions I used one of the decals from the Warbird decals that represented the wing walk area and using a set of dividers I simply transferred the measurements from the decal to the fuselage and applied the tape accordingly. There's also a line, uh, maybe a walkway uh, in magnesium color that runs down the center of the upper fuselage between the two regions of dull aluminum forward of the wings. And the width of this area was also laid out using the dimensions from the wing walk decals and dividers before it was masked up for painting. I did this by uh, using a piece of tape cut to the right width uh, with a center line marked in black and I laid this piece of tape down making sure to align the black center line with the center of the fuselage. Then I simply laid down two pieces of blue painters tape on each side of the Temya tape before pulling that tape off uh, to leave the area to be painted. So once they were matched back up with the wings you can see that the panel lines uh, on the fuselage and the wing marking locations were mismatched a bit. Um, so this was just easily corrected by remasking and uh, spraying the darker color to match up with the lines. You'll also perhaps notice uh, my mistake when I masked the wings. I used a different set of panel lines on the starboard and port wings. Uh, fortunately this error, error will be covered up by the wing walk demarcation line decal. <laughs> Now here's our final masking uh, before we can start decaling and this involved the radar dome on the bottom of the fuselage uh, using very thin strips of tape. Uh, thin strips of tape can go around corners see and I outlined the dome itself and then laid one piece of tape across the dome dividing it in half as if only the forward half of the dome was painted black. Now once this is painted uh, essentially all the masking was finished and all the parts, uh, the fuselage, wings, horizontal stabilizers were given two coats of all clad two clear gloss in preparation for the decals. And a gloss finish is necessary because um, parts will silver uh, appear to have a frosty edge if, if they don't uh, go over a uh, glossy surface, a smooth surface. So um, the um, Alclad uh, has a new product. It's a gloss clear coat that's water based uh, and it dries crystal clear and being acrylic it cleans up with soap and water. The kit decals um, had all the tail codes, national insignias and prop decals but they don't have the wing walk areas and uh, associated stencils. And These all came from the aftermarket Warbirds uh, decal set. Now decaling was pretty straightforward but very time consuming 
And uh, the reason for that is because some of the uh, wing walk decals are six inches long. They're very narrow. So um, you have to take your time and make sure that you drop those into place uh, with some warm water so you can position them. As well as the fact that there were so many no-step uh, decals. But uh, they actually uh, make for a better model if you uh, can go out and get yourself some aftermarket uh, items to uh, complete this one. So the only issue that I ran into uh, with my decals um, was pretty much uh, what I did to myself. Uh, the engine nacelle wasn't printed uh, as a mirror of the opposite side and I think it's because I lost track of the decal numbers and and did one backwards or something but uh, keep those uh, separated and straight so that you can get them all into position in the proper place and once again once you've got them down and they've adhered a little bit use some uh, of that uh, uh, setting solution to make sure that they uh, conform and stay into place. Once all the wing walk areas were outlined it was time to add the no step and do not walk uh, between the line decals and there's close to 70 of those in different sizes and orientations so pay close attention to the um, decal placement guide. Once I had all of the aftermarket uh, product decals uh, in place then I started working with the kit supplied decals and they went on very well. Uh, there were no problems even for the age of these decals, but uh, the only issue I ran into was with the large S uh, inside the triangle on the tail, on, on both sides of the tail. The triangle itself is made up of two separate decals, but the large S is one decal with clear decal film between four of the uh, parts on the S. And in the photo, uh, number 17 refers to one part of the triangle, not the S. And since there's a very large and very deep gap between the rudder and the tail fin, it's easier to cut the S decal into four separate pieces and apply them individually. This prevents the decal from possibly not laying flat on the surfaces along the inside uh, and the gap. That sounds complicated, but it's really not as hard as you might think. Um, I first applied uh, number one here, the far right lower section of the S, by aligning it along the rudder tail fin gap, and then number two with number one, and then followed by number three aligned with number one, and lastly I aligned number four with number two. While some of the decals were settling into position, um, I assembled and painted uh, the few remaining parts here, uh, which included the jet pods that were primed gloss black before bring, being sprayed with the polished aluminum and the landing gear. Now the landing gear are very simple units as there's only one strut to paint and each of the four tires uh, for each of the main gear is molded as a single piece so there's no gluing or seam, seam clean up there. Then the, the struts were uh, sprayed uh, with uh, testers uh, chrome silver that's uh, FS171718 as were the wheel hubs and the tires uh, were then painted using some Tamiya rubber rubber black it's XF85. The same process was used for the forward landing gear strut and wheels and tires. The landing bay doors were painted interior green on the inside and Tamiya gloss uh, red that's X7 on the outside. Now I didn't uh, get close up to that but you can see from the completed landing gear units here uh, how those uh, look and how they're uh, installed and again the nose gear and the main gear doors were painted the same inside and out. One of the last items needing some construction are the bomb bay doors and on the real aircraft these are operated in a kind of clamshell arrangement meaning that one part of the door folded back on itself and then the whole door opened outward. Um, Ravel supplies these doors as two pieces, so you need to, to bend one section back against the other and glue them together on the inside. Uh, in the picture, you can see where I've slightly scored the plastic using the back of a hobby knife blade um, so it's almost cut through. Then using your fingers, simply bend the two halves until those little nubs come together. Uh, then apply some glue to the nubs uh, to hold the two halves together. Again, in, the inside was painted interior green and the outside painted gloss black before being sprayed with the polished aluminum. Now at this point, 
the entire model was given uh, two coats of the Alclad uh, ALC 600 clear gloss to seal, to seal in all of the decals and the paint in place. Uh, a final uh, bit of painting here included the anti-glare panel in front of the cockpit. And this is done after the final clear coat because the panel is uh, flat olive drab. And this area was simply outlined with thin strips of Tamiya tape and the surrounding area covered up and then sprayed uh, using some uh, model, model Masters Olive Drab FS 34087. And lastly, the, uh, the top of the tail section is painted uh, gloss red. And I had forgotten to paint this when I did the landing gear bay doors, but uh, I just used some gloss red paint, the X7, and did so I didn't need to use clear gloss over the red after it was painted. Now this bird's just about done, but there's one last item to finish. That's the radio antenna wire that extends from the tail down to a point between below the cockpit on the port side of the fuselage. Now there's many ways to uh, make radio antenna wires, but I prefer to use a product called Easy Line. It's a thin black elastic material uh, that stretches, and um, it works very well because since it's stretchy, you you can't damage it once it's, it's already in place. So using a pair of tweezers, uh, insert the end of the easy line into the uh, and a, in a drop of uh, super glue and then you touch the drop of super glue with a drop of glue accelerator. So that anchors uh, the easy line at one end and now cut it just a little bit short of the other end where it would go and uh, stretch it out a little bit. Then make sure you cut the piece uh, short enough so that when you stretch it um, there's no slack in the line. Now place a small drop of super glue uh, where it goes. Insert the easy line again and then touch the super glue with a drop of accelerator and it'll stay in place and look sharp. So there you have it. Uh, one final note there was a couple of struts that looked like they uh, attached to the the uh, jet pods uh, to brace them with the wings and um, I didn't see that on very many of the photos that uh, I had researched so I left those off but that uh, that's an option uh, it's up to you now there there was a few minor paint touch-ups that uh, I had to do of course and uh, I call her finished though I spent uh, nearly a year building this uh, it's quite uh, it's quite large and uh, I do have uh, a picture of the 172 uh, Curtis P-40 Warhawk to give you a sense of scale for the size of this airplane which was in fact the largest bomber ever deployed by the Air Force. Um, it's really not that difficult to build uh, however some of the uh, decaling that you'll have to do um, will really require some extra work. Uh, so I complicate it by uh, being uh, using Alclad paints because um, they take a lot of prep and, and uh, and taping, uh, but um, still I think that the results were worth it. So if you can find one of these kits on the internet, I would seriously consider uh, uh, getting one and putting one on your shelf or hanging it from your ceiling. Well, we hope you liked this step-by-step -step premium model kit review, and so that you don't miss any more, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. But you can also find us on Facebook, and as always, at our website www.rightonreplicas.com. Thanks.